So as I said, I'm the other co-chair um, and I'm going to quick talk today about HPLC. I can't really do it much justice in 10 minutes, but I will try. Um, HPLC stands for High Performance Liquid Chromatography and as it says on the title there, it's a useful analytical tool for separation, identification and purification of compounds that are in a mixture. Before I talk about high performance liquid chromatography, it does only seem fair to give you a bit of a background on what is actual liquid chromatography. So, it's a technique for separating the mixture. It's based on the physical and chemical properties of the compound, and the most important is the polarity of the compound. And polarity of a compound is all to do with how water soluble it is. So, if it's got a high polarity, it's very water soluble. If it's got a low polarity, then it's low water soluble. And because of the differences in the physical properties of the compound, you can separate them using this liquid chromatography. And what you do is you take your mixture of your sample and you dissolve it. This is called your mobile phase, and then you pass it over something called a stationary phase. And then because of the difference in the properties of the compound, it'll separate out. With something called normal phase chromatography, the mobile phase that you pass through is non-polar and the stationary phase is polar. And therefore, if you've got a compound that is quite polar, it'll stay on the stationary phase because the thing to remember is like dissolves, like people like the, the compound like to be friends with things that are like themselves. That's the way I try to remember it. So if you've got a polar compound and a polar stationary phase, they're gonna to wanna to stay together, they're gonna to wanna to hold hands and go off together into the moonlight the way I like to see it. And so if you've got a non-polar stationary phase, they're gonna to wanna to stay together and cling on to each other as well. So the more polar a compound it is, the more it'll absorb onto the stationary phase and stay there and therefore the longer it'll take to leave the system. And you can predetermine what molecules will come off in one order, what order because of this. You can go with a log P on Wikipedia and you'll find out from this basically how polar it is and therefore what order you expect them to come off in, which is then useful because you can see from the computer printouts what you're expecting them where. So how do you do a liquid chromatography? Well, this isn't high prep, high performance liquid chromatography. This is just a basic one. So you have a column that contains your stationary phase. Um, for normal phase, that would be like a silica-based compound, so it's not quite polar. You then put your sample on the top, and I say that contains a mixture of compounds. You add your solvent. Um, it's non-polar, so it's not like hexane or chloroform and dill. And as soon as you add your solvent, it starts to separate your mixture out and then you can collect them at different time points because it separates out quite nicely and most things will separate into colours like this. If you've got something that is a mixture that separates into all the different like compounds and the way that we show this with certainly the younger kids is we give them a smarty and ask them to do a chromatography with a smarty and just for one colour smarty it separates into loads of different colours and that's based on the polarities of the different dyes. Based on what I said, like dissolves like, this would be the most polar compound because it likes to stay on the stationary phase like dissolves like, and that would be the least polar compound, and then you can collect these at the bottom. So now I've spoken a little bit about liquid chromatography, talk about high performance. You have high pressure mobile phase, so a high pressure solvent being pumped through the system and using very, very small particle size on your column, and this gives you very efficient separation of your compound. It's also referred to as high pressure liquid chromatography and that's because of the high pressure system that you use. It's great for the separation of non-volatile or thermally sensitive compounds. Some examples of these are uh, pharmaceuticals, proteins, organics and with a thermally unstable you can use enzymes, um, amino acids and for example trinitrotoluene which is TNT which you definitely wouldn't want to heat up of any description. So the system, well, that's what it looks like. And I know that doesn't mean a lot to anybody, so I've broken down into a bit of a diagram. And as you can see, at the beginning here, you have, <coughs> this is your solvent, so as I say, hexane or your chloroform, whatever you want to push through the system. This goes through a pump, and you pump it through whatever rate your method tells you to. Usually it's about one mil a minute, so it's a really low cost in the sense that you're not using very much solvent at all. And then you have something called an auto sampler, which is where you put your sample on and then a small part of it gets injected, usually about 20 microliters. So you only have to use a tiny amount of sample, which means that if you're doing micro experiments, you only have to use a tiny amount of sample, so not going to waste. 
Then you have your stationary phase, which is your column, which where all your separation occurs, and then that moves on to a detector. Use different detectors, UV, VIRS, um, loads of different types of ones, and then that goes onto the computer, which then does its fancy work. I don't know what it does, but it turns it into a nice little printout, and then from the detector, it goes into the waste. Or if you don't want to have it go into the waste, you can actually collect off the different fractions, and then you've got pure fractions of a beach like molecule that you've got then. So from the computer printout, you get what's called a chromatogram. And this is what a chromatogram looks like. And as you can see, you get different peaks. Each different peak would represent a different compound that is in that mixture. And with the peaks, the, the size of the peak increases with proportion to the concentration of compound that you've got. And that's something that's quite useful because you can then use the size of these peaks to actually determine how much of something you've got in a mixture. So if you're looking for a particular amino acid in blood, for example, you can say, okay, because of this peak is this area, I know that X amount of amino acid was present in that blood sample. Or you can do it with pharmaceutical products. I know certainly um, GlaxoSmith & Klein, they use this as an analytical tool to test the um, quality of the aspirin pharmaceutical products and to check that when it says 200 milligrams of aspirin it really does mean 200 milligrams of aspirin. Um, so as you can see from this, the most non-polar compounds again will come up first and you would know what that was because you've gone and looked up what the log P's of it are so you can then say okay from this peak here I know what it is and you can do the analytics of that then. So what can you use it for? Well, you can use it for qualitative analysis, so just simple identification. Is something present? Or sometimes, more importantly, is it not present? So you use what's called retention time, which is basically if you keep your solvent the same, your system the same, all of your technique the same, your retention time for any given compound will stay exactly the same. It'll fluctuate by literally 0.10 of a second. So, it's a very good way of identifying that a compound either is or isn't present. You can use it quantitatively. So you use either peak height or peak area, and as I say, they change in proportion to how much of a concentration you've got. And what you can actually do is you can get a calibration curve. So if you know what compound you're looking for, you can get a calibration curve for it. And then for any given peak area, you can know exactly what concentration was in your sample. And I say this is really useful for blood analysis, <coughs> pharmaceutical analysis, or if you've done a chemical experiment and you want to know exactly how much product you've made to see how efficient your system is, it can be used for that as well. It can also be used for preparative <coughs> reasons. So if you've done, say, a chemical synthesis and you know that you've got some byproducts or some things that you don't want in there, you just want to collect your product off 100% pure, you can use this and I say you can collect it afterwards and therefore you've got a 100% pure product and nothing else, you've got just exactly what you wanted to, there's no contamination in it, you've not, not got no worries about it not being pure and to do this you just use a preparative HPLC column and then you can concentrate that by evaporating it off and you can use that for you know, whatever you'd like to use after that then. So, I know it's a bit brief, um, it's all I can really say in 10 minutes, but if anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And I also do have a couple of reports here that I wrote when I was in university. Um, one of them is about the um, analysis of aspirin tablets that we went and bought from Boots, just to see whether they had in what they said they had in. Um, and another one is just about how a system changes with solvent composition changes to so how you can change the efficiency of separation.
So it can be useful for that as well, sort of to prove that what you're saying has happened, has actually happened. Yeah, what kind of concentration levels is it going to be? Um, it depends on what you use, and but some of them can go down to nanograms. Um, it really is. It's quite a sensitive technique. It's got a really low detection limit, um, and it's got a really good sensitivity as well. Um, but yeah, it just depends on what you use, and what I use nanograms, and it detects just fine. And I say you only need to use like 20 microliters, and that's quite a big injection size as well. I tend to use 10 microliters, so it's really a small sample size, which is good if you've not got much sample to use. Anyone else? So I've got a report up here if anyone wants to grab one afterwards and some night time reading. Thanks again.